Okay, let, uh, let me just begin with the uh, uh, three uh, brief announcements. Uh, one, uh, I've been asked by a couple of you about the first paper and when you'll get the prompts. So you'll get the prompts uh, by email on Friday. Uh, you may even get them as early as tomorrow, but you'll certainly get them by Friday. Uh, the due date for the paper is uh, the 25th. It's mentioned on the syllabus as well. Um, and, and this paper and all subsequent papers will be due in class, not, not in section. This is to ensure that everyone returns the paper, you know, hands in the paper at the same time. And of course, papers will be returned uh, in class uh, rather than in section. Uh, number two, uh, it seems that the previous two recordings didn't come out well. Uh, the first recording apparently didn't come out at all. I have no idea why that might have been the case. And I've been told by the technical people that there was some kind of uh, audio problem in the second recording. Uh, but uh, they have assured me that they have fixed that problem and, and we shouldn't have that problem today. If you're trying to access the lectures, you simply do that by logging into you know, your Bruin account and going to the course website. And then on the left-hand side, uh, you'll see a link called Media Resources and you click on that and that's where you'll be able to access uh, all the lectures for this class. Uh, and thirdly, I have office hours today, but those office hours have, have to be changed uh, because I have a meeting. So the altered office hours for today are 3.30 to 4.15. All right. So what I want to do is I want to take a few, uh, just a few minutes to recapitulate a few things uh, about the French Revolution. And then I'm going to move on to uh, the Haitian Revolution. Um, and I hope I uh, have uh, a little bit of time left. Uh, to entertain a few thoughts about the Industrial Revolution, and we're going to continue with the Industrial Revolution uh, in my subsequent lecture on, on Friday. Um, and uh, I, I, I want to begin by just showing you a couple of images, and then I'm going to uh, offer a few concluding thoughts on the French Revolution. So this is an image where, you know, the, the king, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, had actually fled, um, and they were captured uh, while they were trying to flee the country. And so this is... Uh, in the second half of 1791, uh, and this shows their return to Paris. Uh, and here, what you have here is uh, uh, Napoleon, uh, because you mentioned, you recall that I'd mentioned to you, and if, and if you've done the, you know, the, the reading, uh, the Nehru reading, and more generally, uh, you know that uh, there was a restoration of the monarchy. I mean, Napoleon declared himself an emperor, uh, and if this was a course entirely on European history. Uh, rather than world history, we would have spent a little bit more time on the Napoleonic Wars, as they're called. Uh, but in the large scheme of things, we have, to, we have to omit that. One of the interesting things, however, that was done by, uh, by Napoleon was they introduced a new calendar. Uh, they introduced a new calendar, um, and the 18th Brumaire, which is the 18th November 9th, uh, is the date when Napoleon was brought to power uh, and becomes the first Council of France. Uh, and that is the inauguration of the new calendar. Uh, and you know that this often, often happens when religions are created. We know that the Gregorian calendar, of course, it's a long complicated of history of how we got the Gregorian calendar, but uh, the, beginning, uh, the beginnings of that, uh, of course, are the birth of Christ, right? Uh, and similarly, uh, in Islam, you have a calendar which marks the migration of uh, the, the prophet uh, from Mecca to Medina. So forth and so on. So, so when you have a creation of a new calendar, it, it, is a, it is a sign of the creation of a new age, as it were. Uh, this, is, this is what was being signified. Uh, it didn't last very long. It didn't last very long because, of course, what you had was a restoration of the monarchy. You had a different kind of terror then. Uh, uh, and eventually, things were restored back to where they were. Remember what I'd said to you about the word revolution and the prefix uh, uh, in that word. All right, uh, and here we have a caricature. Uh, I, I, in fact, I recall that my concluding remark to you on Wednesday was the fact that this was also the age when you have um, a kind of a, a different kind of print revolution. You have a pamphlet war being fought. There are, there are a thousand, certainly hundreds of new newspapers being founded. Um, and uh, there is a tradition of caricature which starts to become very important. I mean, there are English periodicals such as The Punch for example, uh, which are going to excel in something like uh, the, uh, uh, something that you might call the character. And then in this particular print, what you're seeing is a tricolor ribbon here, which, uh, which on you know, two sides, which says no God, no religion, no king, no constitution. 
Uh, so th this is an expression of concern by someone who is saying, well, what's left? The French Revolution has done away with the king. It's done away with religion. It's irreligious, right? There's no God. Um, and there's no constitution. Of course, there's a new constitution. Uh, and then be beneath, beneath that, what you see is you see two bloody axes that represents, of course, uh, attached to a guillotine. Uh, I recall my comments to you about the iconic sig significance uh, of the guillotine. Uh, and this blade of the guillotine is suspended above a burning globe, right? So the implication being that the French Revolution is now going to be disseminating. Uh, and wherever it goes, it's going to create a fire. It's going to create havoc. Because obviously this character caricature is by someone who is uh, looking at this with a certain amount of dismay, right? Uh, and then you see there on the left an emaciated man and a drunken woman uh, dressed in ragged clothes. Uh, and this suggests, again, uh, in the introduction of a certain kind of anarchy, right? Uh, because uh, on the floor, what you see is discarded royal and clerical regalia, you know, all the signs of the clergy, the aristocracy, uh, and so on. Um, and this uh, fi final slide uh, is, uh, this is a copy of a text of, of uh, the Friends of the People, uh, which was a, uh, a, a document written by Marat, one of the great figures of the revolution. Uh, this is now in the collection of the Bibliothèque Nationale uh, in, in Paris. All right. Now, let's just try to very briefly recapitulate a few things about the French Revolution. Um, and I think this recap recapitulation is essential also, not just to remind you of its uh, major characteristics, but I think it will help us understand um, the Haitian Revolution, what made the Haitian Revolution different, in what respects was the Haitian Revolution an advance, perhaps, upon the French Revolution. And we could fill in a lot of details uh, if we looked at that, more, more so than what I have already given you in my previous lecture. Uh, for example, in December 1793, uh, there was a new law that introduced uh, primary schooling uh, as an obligation on the part of every French citizen. Right? So if you think about the era in which you're living now, the, this whole idea that schooling is compulsory and so on, and that, the pub, and that this is a public good, there must be public investment in schooling, well, some of this really goes back to the French Revolution. Right? Um, and the subjects that were obligatory, that were made obligatory by the terms of this law were, were reading, writing, arithmetic, and revolutionary ethics, revolutionary civics. That was, in fact, a compulsory subject uh, at this point in time. Um, uh, primary education was made free for all children between the ages of 6 and 13. Um, and later in November, uh, that is of 1794, the law stated that the education was not compulsory, uh, but nonetheless, uh, the instruction would be always in French. All right, and then, so this is a little bit, it's not clear exactly what's happening here, but I think you'd have to look at, let's say, later works by, let's say, someone like, by Eugene Weber, in fact, who used to teach here, um, uh, who wrote a wonderful book, Peasants Turned Into Frenchmen, where he argued that, in fact, uh, there was a significant portion of what you call France, let's say, around 1800, where French was not, in fact, the dominant language. Breton, for example, was a much more important. Um, uh, language. So this is, this is, I think, what this particular law is referring to. But without getting into all these details, because one could give many other details of this kind, in a capsule view of it, we have to say that if you look at it in economic terms, the French Revolution was anti-feudal in spirit and capitalist. Right? So if you're looking at, you know, this is not, of course, the origins as such of um, modern capitalism, but it gives a, it gives a uh, you know, encouragement to, to those who are arguing for what you might describe as a capitalist uh, regime. Um, in social terms, it was anti-aristocratic. I think that that's fairly clear enough. Anti-royalist. Uh, Anti-royalist can be understood in many ways, but I think the principal way in which you want to understand it is that the French Revolution signified the opposition to the idea of the divine right of kings, right? And it was bourgeois in characteristic. Bourgeois here, this is a term that Marx is going to use constantly, and I think one way to understand it is to simply look at it as a kind of a emerging middle class, 
um, uh, a, a, you might say, an, an, an entrepreneurial, uh, mercantilist kind of middle class of a modern sort. Right? And then in national terms, and I don't think I can emphasize this enough, the French Revolution puts forward the idea of one indivisible nation, right? One indivisible nation. I mean, so you have the national anthem, La Marseille, right? Um, and think of it this way. I, and I recall again that I had concluded my remarks to you uh, on Wednesday with this observation as well, uh, namely that every nation state has a national anthem, or nearly every nation state. And the minute a nation becomes independent, it usually commissions a new national anthem. And of course, the national anthem is, we can look at the politics of the idea of the national anthem, not a particular national anthem, not the national anthem of the US or Britain or China or whatever the case may be, but the very idea of the national anthem. What it, does it seek to do? It seeks to create certain feelings of loyalty and patriotism among the subjects of that nation state. Right? It may be a very insidious idea because it's a way of, it may be a way of stifling dissent, for example. One could, one could, if one had to do a long explication of the idea of a national anthem, all of that I think would be part of it. But, it, but what's important here is to register the fact that this is one of the many things that emerges out of the French Revolution in the 1790s. All right. So this is sort of a capsule view. Uh, uh, again, a, a view that is not simply based on you know, a series of facts given to you in chronological order, but we are trying to understand some of the larger implications of something like the French Revolution. Now, let's shift our gaze to the Western Hemisphere, all right? Um, and look at what is known as the Haitian Revolution. Not often taught, I would argue, in history textbook, and certainly not taught I would say in history textbooks in the United States for the most part, um, uh, or in most parts of the Western world. Um, and we have to keep in mind, of course, that when we're looking at the Haitian Revolution, you know, you need to keep in mind these uh, key words here. Why is this important? Because, because it brings the question of race to the fore. Uh, it's a way of trying to understand the institution of slavery. Of course, uh, the institution of slavery was widespread at this juncture, right? The Haitian Revolution is going to start in 1791. Uh, the Republic of Haiti is going to be declared in 1804, on January 1st, 1804. But we know that the institution of slavery, uh, including the institution of slavery in, in, in North America, had now already been in existence for close to, at this point, close to almost 200 years. I mean, the first, uh, the first uh, 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 charter of sale for slaves goes back to about 1612, if I recall correctly, right? Uh, that is in the New World. Uh, and, and so what we're speaking about here is uh, an institution that was already at this point well entrenched. And one of the things that the Haitian Revolution does is it puts into serious question the whole institution of slavery. Uh, then, of course, one of the other key words that comes to mind here is colonialism, because uh, Haiti uh, was uh, at this point, it was not called Haiti as we're going to see, um, uh, but it was, it was a French, uh, French colony, right? Um, and I'll go back to the map in just a moment, uh, but why are we so interested in the Haitian Revolution? We're interested in it for a, a number of reasons. First, it, it is, uh, establishes the first free black republic in the world. Right? You have to remember this that when you're looking at the, the Haitian Revolution, the question that it puts forward is just how universal were human rights, the human rights that were promised in the French Revolution. Right? So when you have a declaration of the rights of man and citizen, well, who really is being included in this and who is being ex excluded? Right? So people are agitating for their rights at this point, we know, in several, several parts of the world now. But when you look at the French Revolution, you have to simply ask the question, are the French prepared to concede rights to black people, for example? Right? And, and this part of the world that we're looking at now is a French colony. 
All right. So what is so? In other words, what the what the Haitian Revolution is doing is it's testing the limits of the French Revolution and the American Declaration of Independence. It is testing the very conception of universal. It's testing the conception of rights. And as I'm going to argue shortly, in 10 or 15 minutes, the Haitian Revolution is extraordinary because it gives rise, based on what someone like Truyo, who's, who a chapter, uh, uh, you know, from whose book a chapter has been included for you, right? That, that he suggests that it actually represents the unthinkable. That what happened there was beyond the realm of imagination of the most enlightened person in Europe. They didn't have the language to even begin comprehending what something like the Haitian Revolution meant. And it brings to the fore, as I've already suggested, the very idea of race. Test the very premises of racist discourse. And then it gives rise to other interesting questions, such as what was its reception in America and France? Right? How, how might it have promoted other slave rebellions in the Americas. Right? And, and again, if we were looking at, a, looking at the Haitian Revolution in a very detailed fashion, um, you know, I could give you extraordinary, gruesome details. For example, in 1802, a force is sent to try to suppress right, the revolution. Remember, it starts in 1791, and finally, January 1st, 1804, a free republic is going to be actually proclaimed. But this force that was sent in 1802, there is no food that is sent with the force. Why? Because if you read the letter written by the commander of the force right, to someone in Haiti who is the commander of forces there, he says, well, you know, it's going to be actually enough. Right? That it's going to be enough if we can, if you look at the black people there, they are going to be basically the food. Right? Those are the words that he uses. Right? They are going to be the food. I mean, and here, of course, you have kind of images of cannibalism and so on. And we know, incidentally, that, that there was a whole breed of dogs that were bred precisely to hunt down slaves. Right, so there's a film, by the way, by Samuel Fuller, an American filmmaker who lived in Los Angeles, died in Los Angeles a few years ago. It's called White Dog. And White Dog, by the way, does not refer to the color of the dog. The dog is white in color. But White Dog refers to the fact that there were dogs that were raised in the American South to attack only black people. Right? And the history of this all goes back to, to Maroons. Maroons are... Maroons are people who were slaves who fled, right, okay, and found refuge in various places. So it goes back to the Maroons, it goes back to, to the days of slavery, it goes back to the wars with the Seminole Indians that were being fought by the white settlers and their use of dogs, and I hope you know, if you don't know this, you should, that most American police forces have canine units. It's called K-9, but it's K-9, of course, you know, dog units. Um, and these were used, for example, during the civil rights period. There's a very famous or infamous photograph which, which dates back to the 1960s, right? To the, to the campaigns in Selma, in Birmingham, in Montgomery. And you can see these, these K-9 units being used to essentially hunt down black people, suppress them, so on. All, the history of all of this is encapsulated here already. Right? So that's what I mean. By, we, could, we could get into enormous detail of that kind. But we want to keep the broader picture in mind here at this particular juncture. Right? And, one of the, and again, we cannot say with absolute certainty or with any certainty that one of the consequences of the Haitian Revolution was the decision taken by the British in 1808 to abolish the slave trade. I want to be very clear that you understand there's a distinction between abolishing the slave trade and abolishing slavery. The two are not the same. That, that did not bring an end to slavery. So if you were already a slave living on a plantation, 
you were still subject to the, to the whims and rules of your master until, of course, it, there was an abolition of slavery itself. But, but Britain was one of the three or four countries that became a signatory to a convention that was passed in 1808, which abolished slavery, the, not slavery, the, the slave trade in 1808. France would do that in 1818, all right? But it did not lead to the abolition of slavery as such. Whether the Haitian Revolution prompted that or not would be obviously a question that historians would have to consider at length. And finally, before we get back to, to trying to understand what is this part of the world um, and what is it that impelled the Haitian Revolution, finally we have to understand the question of reparations. Uh, for those of you who have uh, read some of the recent articles, including one that was written by Tahad Nahisi Coates a few years ago in The Atlantic, where he argued that there should be a system of reparations for black people uh, in this country. Right? Uh, now, the question of reparations is very important in the case of Haiti because you will be astounded to learn that for well over 130 years after the Haitian Revolution, Haiti was compelled to pay reparations for 130 years. In fact, it was, I think, about 1947 that finally the reparations were paid off. And why is Haiti paying reparations? Because, of course, when you had the revolution, um, white slave owners were deprived of their property. Slaves were their property. And so, therefore, they demanded reparations. And France insisted. It sent a whole armada trying to enforce these. I, I, again, a very long, complicated history. So, you know, when, when you have someone like the President of the United States describing the countries of Africa as shithole countries, well, you have to, you have to ask yourself, why, how were these countries reduced to this state, right? And Haiti is a very good illustration of the draconian regime of repression under which it lived repression from the West for really, literally 200 years. That's what we're speaking about in this case, all right? Now, let's just head, go back for a moment. So you have the Greater Antilles, the four islands, Cuba, Jamaica, Haiti, uh, what is now called Haiti and the Dominican Republic. It was San Domingue at that, San Domingue at that time and Puerto Rico. And then the Lesser Antilles, by the way, includes uh, islands such as Barbados, and I, at the moment I can't, uh, Barbados and Trinidad uh, and several other islands, you know, largely very small islands, all right? So that's what we have here is, this is the part of the world that we are really looking at at, at, the, at this particular moment. Um, and here is, a, here is a map which shows you more clearly. So this was the Spanish part, what is now the Dominican Republic, and this is San Domingue, which is what is going to become the Republic of Haiti in 1804. So this is French controlled. Um, the, uh, the, the, the larger eastern part is uh, Spanish uh, controlled, all right? Uh, now, I think it's important to understand a little bit of the history. Um, and I want to start with a proposition. Uh, th this is an article written by a, a friend of mine uh, where he argued that the biggest killer in history is what? Anyone wants to make a guess in the context of what I might be coming to? What, what might be, yes? Sorry? Okay, any other, uh, any other, uh, uh, yes? Mosquitoes, okay, so mosquitoes, yeah? Sorry? Right, yeah. War. But war, yeah, I mean, so you, you could say famine, you could say war. I, how, about, how about a product? How about a product? Yeah. Cotton? A, it's a candidate, but it's not. Think in the, think the long term, the very long term, beginning with, yes? Gunpowder? Gun it's a candidate, but... No, you see, if you if you actually if you think if if you think about all the mem all the people who've been killed on account of you know gunpowder, yes, you could tally it up to hundreds of millions. What is one of the greatest causes of death in the Western world? 
uh, today. To, to, tobacco has been one, but tobacco, but but again, you know, the, if you if you're looking at n number of casualties on account of tobacco, I'm saying look at the totality of it. Sugar, sugar, the biggest killer in history. If you include, for example, diabetes and obesity, you you should read the reports that have been published on the spread of obesity in countries where it was virtually unknown 30 years ago, such as China, and now, or Malaysia, right, where, because Malaysia is a Muslim country, so they don't serve alcohol, uh, you know, but instead, they, they're guzzling down Coke and Pepsi, you know, poison, literally. I mean, if you're gonna have a poison, take a good one at least, that's what I would argue. You know, take, take some good alcohol, you know, uh, instead of, this stuff, right? Sugar. Because then, of course, you have to include slavery, the whole history of slavery in that part of the world, right? I mean, here you're speaking about cotton plantations, but in the Caribbean, it was sugar. Sugar. You, all right? And, and that's what I mean, that you, you, then you track down what's happened with sugar, okay, over the course of the last 300 years. Now, the western part of Hispaniola was taken over by France in the 17th century. Um, and you, the eastern part, as I've already pointed out to you, is, is um, Spanish ruled, uh, who pretty much ignored this, por this part because they had richer resources in places like Mexico and Peru. Okay? Now, uh, these industries in the French portion in San Domingue, uh, you have sugar, you have coffee as well. Uh, but sugar is, is, is the bigger export by far at this point in time. And by the 1760s, it had become the most profitable colony in the Americas. In the Americas. I'm not speaking only about the Caribbean. I'm talking about the Americas, you know, as a whole. All right, let me just give you some figures here, okay? Um, uh, Sugar, which initially, by the way, was used by the wealthy, and then gradually it, it effects begin to percolate down to the masses, and of course as methods of production change, right? When you begin to have refined sugar and all of that, then, uh, and obviously the crop grows, uh, its use starts to percolate down to all segments um, of society. Uh, in the 1780s, Haiti exported 60% of all the coffee and 40% of all the sugar consumed in Europe. Consumed in Europe, all right? Which is more than, and more than half of all of Britain's West Indian colonies combined. By 1789, so this is two years before the onset of the revolution, San Domingue produced three-fourths of the world's sugar. This one place, three-fourths of the world's sugar, and it was a top producer in coffee as well. It was the world's richest colony at this point in time, and one of the busiest trade centers within the new world, receiving 1,600 ships. In the late 18th century, Haiti accounted for nearly one third of the Atlantic slave trade. Right? And then of course you can, you can read accounts of how the slaves were treated. I, I don't think I really need to, need to impress upon you um, uh, that they were treated with barbarism uh, and absolute cruelty, right? Uh, and again, there are, ways to, there are ways to nuance this because you have to remember that even in the most oppressive system, the master has to show some degree of kindness every now and then, right? That's the, na the if you're going to produce consent, if you're going to produce hegemony, you always need to have a little bit of that thrown out, right? So, you know, the slave, uh, slaves uh, daughter of course one method and slavery as we know and this has been documented again is the separation of families right but but remember that when you have the abolition of the slave trade in 1808 uh, in, in the United States slavery will continue formally of course until the Emancipation Proclamation of Lincoln right? 1863 right? so now you so so where, where is a new supply of slaves coming from it's it's slave women who are giving birth 
to children. Right? So these, the, the, these, the new crop, as it were, are slaves who are actually being born here. You're not, you're not, they were, of course, that was always the case to some degree, but you always had, you had fresh shipment of slaves coming in, so long as the slave trade was going on. And this is what I mean, that when, when these women are giving birth here, and this is your only source uh, of slaves now, beginning, uh, for example, in the eight, early 1800s, uh, then the master is, has, is bound to sh display every now and then some, sor some kindness. Uh, not out of the kindness of their heart, but, if, but it's obviously an economically st necessary strategy. Right? You, you have to ensure the conditions which make it possible for women to give birth uh, and for children to grow up to become slaves. All right, now, what were the circumstances the French that led to the Haitian Revolution? The French ex Revolution was doubtless in the backdrop, in the backdrop, right? But I think the most extraordinary thing, and this is the argument, and this is really what, I'm, what I want to spend my time on, I, and that's the reading that was assigned to you, is that one can come up with a whole set of explanations, the treatment of s slaves, which is obviously resented, the fact that the French Revolution has now offered some you know, hope of freedom in some sense, there's some notion of universal rights, now, everything that I showed you in that slide before. There, some of these are obviously the principal considerations. But what is critical here is the fact that to the French, the idea that the black man and the black woman would want to be free was in fact unthinkable. And so in this reading, you have this, this uh, um, quotation uh, where he gives, you know, so he's looking at letters written by Frenchmen who were living in San Domingue, right? At this point in time, all right? And they're writing back home. And, and there's a letter that is written here in 1790. So here's a French colonist, and this is what he writes back to his wife in France, who is in France. She hasn't accompanied him. There is no, and I'm quoting, there is no movement among our Negroes. Why is he even saying that? Because the French Revolution has already taken place. So she might possibly have written to him saying, well, do you see any movement among the Negroes in, in this part of the world? You know, are, are they even remotely interested in resisting? Are they showing any signs of the aspiration to freedom and liberty? So he says, there is no movement. They don't even think of it. They are very tranquil and obedient. We sleep with doors and windows wide open. We have nothing to fear, right? Freedom for Negroes is a chimera. It's a fantasy. It's an illusion. Right? I mean, he's writing with a supreme confidence because he's absolutely certain that you're not going to have any repercussions of the French Revolution in this part of the world because the black man is not even remotely interested in the idea of freedom. He's used to a life of labor. That's the life he loves. And we can leave all our windows and doors open. We don't have to worry. We don't have to protect. You don't have to, you know, what's the expression in English that they use in the Western, you know, uh, circle the wagons. You don't have to do anything of that kind. And this is what leads Trouillot to start thinking, all right, so what kind of public debate was taking place in France? And he says, if you look at France in 1791, there isn't the slightest sign of any debate. There is no public record of any of the great philosophers of the Enlightenment and their successors saying, hey, let's see if, if we can have a discussion on this. We've had a revolution here. We've put out this great declaration of the rights of man and citizen and all of that, right? Maybe, maybe we should have... Uh, a discussion about extending these rights to our colonies. Right? And what he says is that it's a complete blank. There is no debate whatsoever. And the reason there is no debate is given is anticipated in that quotation that I gave. Because the idea of freedom, frankly, is really an idea that only white people have. Right? 
they are not even remotely interested in something called freedom. So this is, this is fundamentally the argument. Now, of course, you can sort of look at all the details because you can do a demography, you know, and you can say, well, what was the distribution of the population? Uh, and all of this is, of course, important because it raises questions which, again, you're going to find in a very different context in different settings later on in places such as India. You'll, you'll understand in a minute what I mean. If you look at the demography of Haiti at this point in time, um, you're talking about 500,000 slaves black slaves, right? Uh, about two-thirds of these were relatively recent arrivals, about two-thirds of them. And they were, had been brought to work on these sugar plantations to some degree on coffee plantations. You had 40,000 white French settlers, right? And you had 30,000 free people of color. So these are people either of mixed ancestry or these were freed black slaves. That's the distribution of the population that we're talking about. Now, what's one of the questions that comes up? You know, how did 40,000 French settlers, white French settlers, control a population of half a million slaves? The same question comes up in the early part of the history of the United States. It wasn't the United States, of course, at that point. I'm talking about the, the colonies on the eastern seaboard, and then gradually, of course, uh, you know, the expansion of the US and all of that, that you, if you look at the distribution in India, you find that at the height of British rule in India, there were 100,000 Britishers. But you're talking about a native population of 100 million, 200 million, depending on which period of time you're talking about. And you say, how did they control a population that large? Right? Right? And the numbers are really skewed when it comes to India. And this is where, of course, you have to look and this is what we're going to do subsequently. I'm not going to talk about it now because I'll be really anticipating myself, but this is where we have to look at the nature of hegemony. What is the nature of hegemony? How is it that, that we are able to persuade sometimes people of a certain point of view? And in this case, how is it that regimes are able to gain the assent of people to certain forms of governance, right? But, they were, but, but when we speak of the Haitian Revolution, I would like to insist upon the fact that this is a kind of a cataclysmic event, but this is not to say that this was in the singular. There were always rebellions. One should not assume that, that there were not rebellions before, and there are what the, friend, what the American anthropologist James Scott has argued in a series of books, everyday weapons of resistance, particularly weapons of resistance of the weak, you know, right? People who, who, don't, who don't have the means to resist in the ordinary sense of the term will resist in various ways. Uh, yeah, I recall reading a book by George Orwell, uh, uh, one of his lesser known books, but a marvelous little book called Down and Out in London and Paris. So here was this man who thought of himself already as a great writer, but he had to make a living as a waiter, and he really resented it. He resented working at restaurants where he would have to serve soup to these rich p clients who came to this restaurant, right? Because he thought of himself as intellectually vastly superior to the people he was serving. And so you know what he did? He writes, he writes it in the book that before he would take the soup in on a tray, he would spit into it. Yeah. It gave him satisfaction. It's a form of resistance for him, you know? He would spit into the soup, you know, and perhaps get a good chuckle out of it. Now, you might think to yourself, well, that's, you know, eccentric or bizarre. No, we have to understand everyday forms of resistance. And so I'm already sounding a caveat, which is that I myself am spending half an hour talking about the Asian Revolution, but I want you to be aware of the fact that history is not simply comprised of a series of revolutions. Uh, and in fact, actually, everyday forms of resistance might be really quite crucial to understand the sensibility of ordinary people and working class people and so on. Um, and, I, and, 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 and when we get to Marx, uh, I think that for all uh, of Marx's greatness, in a sense, sometimes there isn't enough sensitivity to some of these kinds of questions, I would argue. All right. So uh, these are some of the things that emerge from a 
from looking at the Haitian um, Revolution. And you know that the question of representation was important as well, because the whole thing, now you know there's always a match that lights the fire, so to speak. And some people have thought it was simply the French Revolution that was, that, that was a catalyst for the Haitian Revolution. But th there were other catalysts as well. For example, there was a whole question about representation, that when the French Revolution took place, the French settlers in Haiti, I'm just using the word Haiti now for convenience, right? Because as, as I've already said, it, wasn't, it doesn't become Haiti until 1804, all right? Um, they said, well, we want some representation. We want some representation in the legislative assembly in France because we are, after all, French and we are living in a French colony, right? And so they proposed that 20 seats be reserved. And so if you read, if you've read that text, you know that Mirabeau is uh, one of the persons who, rise, who, who then comments in response and says, well, you know, when you're, when you're claiming 20 seats, um, you're, counting all, um, you're counting all the slaves. Mm -hmm. And the slaves don't need representation because if you count them, then in France, we're going to have to count all the horses and mules. And we're going to have to say they need representation too. This is what he says. I mean, just think of it. The sheer inhumanity involved in that kind of response, but it doesn't trigger any kind of outrage or anything of that kind, not at all. And, and this is uh, the whole problem of representation here that we are looking at. And of course, in the United States, you have to remember, if you think that this is particular to it, you have to remember that a black person was three-fifths of a person in the US, officially. Right? And this was a question that came up constantly in the US too, when the question of representation was discussed. All right, so um, now if we get into the details of a different kind, you know, we're going to find that the, that the French are going to send uh, expeditionary forces uh, from France to try to uh, contain this revolution. Uh, it has a great leader. Uh, this leader is uh, Toussaint Overture. Uh, and here you see an engraving. This is an 1802 engraving uh, of him. Uh, the, the huge number of engravings, uh, particularly in subsequent years, that you find. Um, uh, he is not going to be the, the leader of the first uh, free republic because he's going to die shortly before Haiti becomes declared as a republic uh, on January 1st, uh, uh, 1804. Uh, he's going to be succeeded uh, by Jean-Jacques Dessalines. Uh, who is in fact the second in command to to Toussaint um, and leads the insurgents, especially after uh, Toussaint's uh, death. Right? But these details are are, from my point of view, less interesting. Although it is important to note the fact that, unlike the American colonists, when they wage their rebellion against the British. Right, which led to the Declaration of Independence uh, and then the American Revolution, American War. Right? They had the support of the French. The American colonists had the support of the French. The Haitian blacks did not have the support of anyone else at all. This was their struggle. And I think it is all the more remarkable that they were able to actually defeat highly trained expeditionary forces that were sent by the French uh, with, and assisted by a number of, for example, there were actually a substantial number of Polish soldiers. And that's a very long, complicated history of Polish uh, soldiers being used as mercenary forces, uh, right? But it, this is a good illustration of where you can find the Polish actually being used. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, it was basically the French. Here, and I'm saying that these highly trained uh, uh, armies of the French uh, could not actually contain the aspirations of uh, black people. Now, a couple more considerations, and then I'm going to close my discussion of the Haitian Revolution. Right? That I think it needs to be said unequivocally. You can try to try to sort of parse this in various ways. You can try to get softer versions of it, but I think it has to be said unequivocally that a free country ruled by former slaves was not something that the United States welcomed. 
It was not a prospect that they looked at with pleasure at all. And you find a profound degree of ambivalence among many of the great American statesmen, as they're called, of that time. If you look at John Adams, you look at Hamilton, you look at Jefferson, uh, we know enough of what they are really thinking about this, right? Um, so let me just give you a couple of, couple of quotations. Uh, this is actually from the French minister, Charles Talleyrand. He's writing to James Madison, and he's trying to persuade Madison that uh, you should have a, you, you sh that the Americans should try to impose a blockade, right, okay, of the country. Uh, he says, the existence of a Negro people in arms occupying a country it has soiled. I mean, extraordinary. Arrogance, right? Occupying a country it has soiled. Who has soiled the country? The existence of a Negro people in arms occupying a country it has soiled by the most criminal acts. So to rebel is to engage in a criminal act, unless you're white. Right. Then it's noble, right? Then it's aspiration for freedom. But if these people rebel, it's a criminal act. Right? The existence of a Negro people in arms occupying a country it has soiled by the most criminal acts is a horrible spectacle for all white nations, end quote. This is from a letter that he writes to Madison. The fact, by the way, that the Americans didn't agree to that is not, is not out of charitable feelings to the black people there, but these were strategic reasons because you know that shortly thereafter, uh, the whole idea that the Western Hemisphere was going to be off limits to Europe became a dominant part of American thinking, right? The whole idea of manifest destiny, for example, so this, so this is one reason why, because, because the American view was always based on a certain kind of fear of the old European powers meddling in this part of the world. They didn't like that at all, you know, and you can already beginning to see the emergence of carving out the U.S. as a white hemisphere that would now become important in world affairs, right? And Jefferson writes to his daughter, Martha, on 1st December 1793, let me quote, Santo Domingo, he says, has expelled all its whites. Completely, completely false. It hadn't expelled all of its whites. Any more than South Africa expelled all its whites at the end of apartheid. I read that claim in American newspapers, right-wing newspapers, that all whites were being expelled from South Africa. You know, no. That was not the case at all. And so he says has expelled all of its whites, has given freedom to all its blacks, has established a regular government of the blacks and colored people, and seems now have to take in its ultimate form, and that to which all of the West India islands must come, right? So he's, he's expressing concern that this particular rebellion may have repercussions for the rest of the Caribbean, for the rest of the islands in the greater Antilles, uh, and um, obviously, um, you know, the smaller islands and the lesser Antilles as well. The U.S. prohibited all trade with Haiti beginning in 1806. And as I mentioned, out, mentioned to you previously, it did not actually recognize Haiti until uh, 1862, right? And then there's this long history of reparations, which I've pretty much already hinted at. All right, I think I want to just pretty much wind up there by simply showing you the last slide, and then we're going to have to end for the day today, uh, that... Uh, there is a major slave revolt in New Orleans, which takes place in 1811. Um, and uh, there were a number of black people who had come from Haiti as well, who were involved in this slave rebellion. Right? So one of the questions that I had mentioned to you and the slide that I had shown encapsulating some of the major considerations that we have to think about when we think about the Haitian Revolution, one of them has to do with the question of whether the Haitian Revolution uh, actually triggered uh, and engendered uh, rebellions of other kinds as well. And this slave revolt, which takes place around New Orleans in 1811, is a very good illustration of it. You can study this in greater detail when, when all the slides are made um, available to you. Uh, well, unfortunately, we're out of time, so we'll have to uh, start with the Industrial Revolution on 
uh, Friday.